coming. My name is Patrick Marks, and I uh, am the proprietor of the Green Arcade Bookstore. And I really want to thank the Talbot players for uh, putting uh, this forward, Karen Croft and uh, David Talbot, who uh, suggested that we have this conversation uh, because of this book that just came out by Peter Dale Scott, and that is called The American Deep State. And, and Peter has probably written more about this subject than many people. David Talbot uh, wrote this, uh, his most recent book is The Season of the Witch about uh, San Francisco. Great book. He also wrote a book called uh, Brothers about the Kennedys and is now writing a new book that he will tell you about, uh, which is also, um, I would say, about this concept of, of deep government. So without further ado, uh, David Talbot and Peter Dale Scott. Hi, Peter. Hi, David. <laughs> I thought we'd just have a conversation in front of some of our intimate friends here this evening. Uh, well, thank you all for coming out tonight, and uh, thank you to the uh, unparalleled Patrick Marks of Green Arcade. Wow. I'm going to start with a few remarks. Um, I want to, it's, it's a testament to Peter Dale Scott. So don't blush, Peter. Um, but I want to uh, share some of my thoughts about Peter before we begin. And then we're going to get into a dialogue. And it's going to be focused largely on his new book, which I think is very important and in some ways is a synthesis of much of Peter's work over the past few years. Uh, so these are my prepared remarks. Forgive me for reading them. I will make eye contact later with you. <laughs> Power. It's a sexy subject in America. Vanity Fair does its annual list of the most powerful people in the country, the so-called new establishment. Forbes magazine does its rankings of the wealthiest people in the country. But few journalists or scholars have made it their mission to analyze the true realities of power in America, at least not since the pioneering work done by Columbia University sociologist and self-proclaimed anarchist C. Wright Mills author of The Power Elite back in the 1950s. In recent years, it took a former Canadian diplomat, UC Berkeley literature professor and poet named Peter Dale Scott to undertake the most profound scrutiny of American power from the Cold War era to the War on Terror. It was Scott who developed the notion of deep politics back in the early 1990s the insight that America is ruled by a parallel system of power that operates above, and in some ways below, our democratic system of governance. Scott's conception of a deep state, made up of elements within our national security agencies, Wall Street, and big oil, and often working in harmony with repressive states like the Saudi regime, as well as drug cartels and organized crime, is not easily dismissed as conspiracy thinking. Although he identifies central players in the deep state, some of whom have reigned from decade to decade and administration to administration, like Alan Dulles, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld, he believes the deep state is, yes, fine. Fine to hiss. <laughs> Hissing is allowed. He believes the deep state is more than just, quote, a secret team of conspirators. As he writes in his new book, the deep state is not a structure, but a system, as difficult to define, but also as real and powerful as a weather system. Peter himself is hard to define. Sometimes you get the impression that he would rather be discussing Dante over pasta with truffle sauce and a fine <laughs> Tuscan wine than the grim subject of politics. <laughs> His poetry, <laughs> I think I got that right. His father, uh, I'm sorry, uh, his poetry is his first passion, and he comes by this love naturally. His father, F.R. Scott, was one of Canada's most eminent poets and a mentor of L Leonard Cohen. Our own former poet laureate, Robert Hass, has called Peter's epic coming to Jakarta, quote, the most important political poem to appear in the English language in a very long time. Peter has a way of getting at the poetic truth about our political dilemmas. 
quote, we are made schizophrenic by loving America, he has written, which I took to heart. I think it's a very profound insight for many of us. I met Peter several years ago with my, cal with my colleague, Karen Croft, who's in the audience, through our mutual interest in the Kennedy assassination. In fact, my latest book, The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles and the Rise of America's Secret Government, was inspired by a conversation that Karen and I had with Peter. Traumatic episodes like the Kennedy assassinations, ones that have changed the course of American history, are described by Peter as deep events. The explosion of gunfire in Dallas, the Gulf of Tonkin incident that triggered Lyndon Johnson's escalation of the Vietnam War, the October surprise in 1980 that paved the way for Ronald Reagan's victory over Jimmy Carter, the Iran-Contra scandal, the 9-11 attacks. All of these deeply transformational events have an official explanation, and they have designated culprits, as Peter calls them, like Lee Harvey Oswald and the 9-11 hijackers, who were immediately identified as the evildoers. But there is also a deeper explanation for these events, like those offered by Peter, who has developed a poet's brilliance for identifying the deeper meaning of things and decoding the obfuscating language of official reports and connecting the dots. This evening, we'll be discussing Peter's interpretation of the monumental deep events that have changed the course of recent history and tragically deformed our grand American experiment. These deep events have brought us to a juncture where, in the words of Jimmy Carter, the rest of the world almost unanimously looks at America as the number one warmonger, end quote. And as Peter observes in his new book, this permanent state of war that the United States has imposed on the world since World War II has in turn dangerously militarized our own society. Now to an unprecedented extent, he writes, America itself is being treated by those in authority as an occupied territory. Fundamental principles of American society, such as respect for civil liberties and the rule of international law, are being jettisoned, Peter writes, because of the, a, a so-called terrorist threat that is largely of America's own making. The war on terror has become an endless, self-generating conflict that creates more enemies than it eliminates. And now, today, we have President Obama demanding yet more executive authority to widen this war, this war without end. But despite the grim situation we find ourselves in, as Imperial America plows its way into a second century, Peter, being Peter, remains more a prophet of hope than one of doom. He notes that in his book that he has seen during his lifetime the way that popular movements and visionary leaders have brought nations and peoples back from the brink of destruction and have chosen life and liberty over death and subjugation. In fact, we have in the audience this evening, although he's being very modest, one such inspirational figure, someone who during the bloodiest days of the Vietnam War enlightened himself and then enlightened the world through the heroic release of the Pentagon Papers. We welcome, of course, Daniel Ellsberg, and we'll be inviting him, if he's so inclined, to uh, pose a question or two for Peter later this evening. Dan continues to be a great inspiration to a younger generation of brave whistleblowers who have taken on the American war machine, including Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and Edward Snowden. But first, without any further ado, I want to welcome Peter Dale Scott, author of the important new book, The American Deep State, Wall Street, Big Oil, and the Attack on U.S. Democracy. Peter, on behalf of our wonderful host, Patrick Marks of Green Arcade, an oasis, by the way, of literary and political culture in the belly of the corporate digital beast. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say what a pleasure it is to speak with you this evening. Peter. Um, 
David, what, didn't you realize that after all that, anything I say is going to be an anticlimax? <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll uh, do, you'll hold up quite well, Peter. Well, let's start with the obvious. What, what exactly, how do you define the deep state? Well, I'm going to, um, the deep state actually is a phrase I used back in 2007 for America. It was originally used about Turkey. And then it, it went sort of viral last year. And on the Bill Moyers show, somebody called Mike Lofgren, whose background, by the way, is Republican, he came up with a very good definition, which I will read, because it's something that he and I share. And then I will make my own issues with it, but it's a good starting point. And it's page 11, and it says, this is Mike Lofgren on the Bill Moyers show. There is the visible government situated around the mall in Washington, and then there is another more shadowy, more indefinable government that is not explained in Civics 101 or observable to tourists at the White House or the Capitol. The former is traditional Washington partisan politics, the tip of the iceberg that a public watching C-SPAN sees daily and which is theoretically controllable via elections. The subsurface part of the iceberg I shall call the deep state which operates according to its own compass heading regardless of who is formally in power. And that's the really important thing, that uh, we go back and forth, Republican, Democrat, and so on, but the, the really deadly programs don't change. I mean, the drones started under Bush. The drones are bigger, and we're gonna come back to the drones, but the, the real scandal about the drones is we had a Republican president, Ford, who said by executive order that America does not assassinate, period. Back in the 1970s. That was back in, in 1975, and it was to, actually very interesting, it was to stave off the church committee investigation of the CIA. They were trying to stop things from going too far. And now we have a Democratic president who uh, just signs off on killing people without any judicial process whatsoever. And, and the wrong people repeatedly are getting killed. Or even at one famous time, they, they, they got the man they wanted, but he was negotiation, ne ne negotiating with one of the most moderate leaders in Yemen, and the two of them, of course, got killed. So I think it's a very high priority to end this drone if anything it symbolizes for the rest of the world that America has a killer culture, and we do, and of course it goes back to the Indians and everything, but now it's focused on this issue of drones, and somehow we have to get that to stop. Well, let's talk about the- Oh, no, can yeah, I, I, sure, I'm yeah. not finished. The trouble <laughs> with- <laughs> I know I mustn't go on too long, but uh, the trouble with the iceberg Metaphor. It's a very good metaphor, but it suggests that everything down there is solid, just like everything up on top is solid. And that's where I brought in the statement that what's down below is not a structure. It, it, to some part, it's a composite of structures, but it is so incredibly vaster that it's better to think of it as a system like a weather system. And there are various layers. Another metaphor is an onion. You know, the top layer of the onion is the government and the Constitution. The next layer is the CIA and the NSA and, and now JSOC in the Pentagon, which is perhaps more sinister even than the CIA. And then you get another layer in my book, which is these private consulting companies like, I can say quite a lot about Booz Allen Hamilton, ostensibly a private company, but internationally they've been very in sync since 1953 when both of them started operating in the same com countries. It was interesting that CIA went in to overthrow the government in Iran, and there was Booz Allen Hamilton. They developed a close relationship with Nasser. It was really done mostly through Booz Allen Hamilton. So these are private companies that are part of the power structure. And then we're on our way to the corporations and the banks that Booz Allen also do their business with. And then finally you come to Wall Street and the bankers 
And I do have a quote here from Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, talking to his friend Colonel House, saying that you and I know, this is his words, that a financial element has controlled this country since the age of Jackson. And the only thing wrong with that quote is he didn't go far enough back. <laughs> Well, so going back then to sort of the uh, recent origins and recent history of what you call the deep state, um, it really did seem to go into hyperdrive under Eisenhower. When the Republicans finally took power uh, in Washington after long democratic rule, um, and it really has its roots in some way in the nuclear age, because as you write about, you call it the doomsday project. There was, a, in many ways, an understandable effort by the part of the federal government in the case of a nuclear attack, to set up a, uh, a shadow government or a government that would survive uh, the nuclear assault. Uh, it was, it's kind of satirized, in fact, in Dr. Strangelove, uh, the film, which Dan Ellsberg, I know, has referred to as a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and having worked with some of the uh, nuclear madmen himself, he, he's in a good position to describe it that way. But in any case, the Doomsday Project, Peter, what, what exactly was the Doomsday Project? Well, first of all, it's not my phrase. It's the Pentagon's phrase for continuity of government planning, which was really necessary um, after uh, Truman, uh, well, let's not even go back, just, just Eisenhower. They faced the fact that there was a risk, a legitimate concern about a nuclear war in which the government would be decapitated. And the succession for the, who runs the country would no longer apply if the top five or six people had all been killed at the same time. So you started this COG planning, and they called it the Doomsday Plan. And by the way, on the cover of the book, I have this a, a, a dramatic over-representation of what actually happened on 9-11. You have the White House here and flying over the White House in airspace which is never supposed to be entered by any plane, you had what the Pentagon calls the doomsday plane, which is the seat of government in a B-747 that would continue to run the country if the everything on the ground had been annihilated. And they developed at a cost of more than $8 billion, a whole second communications network to be in touch with that doomsday plane. And most of you probably know, they hollowed out mountains around Washington. Uh, you, you probably, how many people did not know that there's a place for a secret government inside a mountain near Washington? Is this Dick Cheney's undisclosed yeah. uh, yeah. location? Yeah. Now, so most people know that, but not many people know that as soon as uh, Bush was back, President Bush was back in Washington on 9-11, because one of the rules of COG is that in a crisis, the president and the vice president separate. So Cheney went off not alone, but with about 100 bureaucrats and lived inside a mountain for the next 90 days. And I don't know which was the more important government for those 90 days, the one which was in Washington or the one which was hatching up inside a mountain, things like Project Endgame, well, the change in the FISA laws. It, from the 1980s, it was clear that there were three basic principles to continuity of government planning. And that was warrantless surveillance, which of course we all know about now, thanks to Edward Snowden, which we, had, we did have a FISA Act and then it got overridden after 9-11. Warrantless detention, uh, Project Endgame was launched in September of 2001. I can't prove it came from the mountain, but I believe this is a, a, just a final codification of what these secret planners on COG and they planning for 20 years. So the COG process was clearly underway before 9-11. You, you talk yeah. about in the book how the Patriot Act itself had its roots in an earlier time. Right. And it was in some ways they were all ready to go with the Patriot Act when the, when the trauma happened. They produced this 300-page act out of nowhere, like the Tonkin Gulf Resolution was produced out of nowhere. Or the, 
There's another case, too, that most people don't know about. When Bobby Kennedy was killed, it took him 24 hours to die. And before he was dead, Congress had passed an act giving all kinds of special powers to the Secret Service that were responsible for a lot of the worst things that happened under Watergate. So this is, in a sense, an old trick. Um, you have a crisis and you whip out something that's ready. And if you didn't know it, two, there had been this, a big change in COG planning occurred under Reagan in 1982. Uh, because every administration did it, but it was always for an atomic attack until Reagan, and then, and this was codified in Executive Order 12656. It's now not for an atomic attack, but for any emergency that threatens the security of the United States. 9-11 was such a, a, an emergency, and it was implemented. And two reviews of my first book on 9-11 said, Scott conjectures that it was implemented. No, it's right there in the 9-11 Commission report, that it was implemented, and they have a footnote in saying this is continuity of government planning. We did not look into this. They didn't have the clearance to look into it. So there are big gaps. Peter, in, in some ways, your, your uh, work uh, parallels uh, Naomi Klein's uh, thinking in the shock doctrine in which he says that the powers that be are quite ready and uh, able to, to exploit uh, shocks to the system, whether they're uh, natural disasters or whether they're uh, military assaults like 9-11. One of the things I was most interested in in your book, and I had forgotten this, is how the Patriot Act in some ways was pushed through Congress because of the panic in Washington that was precipitated by the anthrax letters that was, were sent uh, conveniently and coincidentally, uh, to the two Democratic senators, Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy, who were most strongly opposing the Patriot Act. Right, and were in a position to oppose it because uh, Leahy was the chairman of a committee and Daschle was the leader of the Senate. The, the theory was that these wild uh, Arab terrorists, I mean, they had fake uh, notes that suggested. Well, the idea was that they'd been sent by Saddam. This, the, right. That, that there was Saddam's so, work. And so of course, they never saw it. Sent them to the opposition, that, which doesn't right. make any sense, does right. it? There was the first theory. There's a very good book out that people should know about and, and hopefully buy called the, uh, the Anthrax Deception by Graham McQueen, another Canadian, by the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, he points out that it, much like the Kennedy assassination, where in the first hours it was being blamed on Cuba or Russia, so the anthrax was being blamed on Iraq. And he shows the very, very close coordination between the dates that crucial propaganda pieces appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and that was the day that the letters were mailed, mailed to the opposition that were trying to block the Patriot Act. Well, then we went from uh, a phase one, Iraq did it, to phase two, no, it was a lone nut somewhere in the American bio-warfare system. First of all, a man called Stephen Hatfield, and then a man called Bruce Ivins. But uh, this book satisfies me that neither man was in a position to know anything about weaponizing anthrax. This wasn't a crude shipment. This was very sophisticated, weaponized anthrax. And that, that made good sense if you're going to blame it on a wreck, but it makes no sense at all if you're trying to blame it on Professor Hatfield or Professor Ivins. It was not a one-man job, just as the Kennedy assassination was not a one-man job. So that the anthrax is the most, it's the most blatant uh, example of something being terribly wrong in this deep event, and I'm just amazed that America has been willing to forget about it. Another one of the stranger uh, also threads throughout the 9-11 drama has been the role of the Saudi royal family, and that, that angle is back in the news again, of course, in the last couple of days. Uh, uh, more allegations that the Saudis uh, helped finance 9-11. You have a lot to say about the interesting collusion between uh, the powers in Washington, national security agencies, uh, the oil industry, and the Saudi family. 
Can you uh, go into that a bit? Yeah. How it relates to 9-11? Well, yes, it's very important in my book. And I do want to make it clear, I do not say that the Saudis financed 9-11. There are people who believe that and are suing for millions of dollars. Uh, but the, uh, let's just begin what was wrong about the war on terror, Bush's war on terror from the very outset. The three countries that were doing most to back Saudi terrorists were Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and maybe I should say United Arab Emirates too. They became our chief allies in this supposed war. The chief uh, enemies of these terrorists before they turned on America were Iraq, Gaddafi, and Iran. And somehow, these became America's enemies. So we're fighting a war on terror in which we're on the same side as the terrorists. And not much is said about that. Now, to come to this question of financing, it's very important. Uh, you, I'm sure everyone knows there are 28 pages that may, we may finally get to see from the Joint Congressional Inquiry in 2002 uh, and it's all about Saudi financing going to at least two and probably more of the alleged hijackers, the designated culprits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a great deal to say about this, which is hard to condense, um, but it seems quite obvious, and we come into the question that the CIA was cognizant of what was going on and was actually protecting these two specific, uh, Al-Hamidar and Al-Hamzi, these two particular terrorists, one should have been very worried about, and the FBI should have been notified, and the CIA, somebody from the FBI in the CIA tried to notify the FBI, was told he couldn't do it, and then just to make things cover over this scandal, the CIA put out a cable saying that the FBI had been notified when they hadn't. So from all of this, we deduce that the CIA and the Saudis had some kind of joint operation going on. And I can speculate more in detail. But the important thing is they had a joint operation. And this is an, an analogy with the Kennedy assassination again. The people who designed 9-11, and obviously, 9-11, besides the designated culprits, there are real culprits somewhere, and I don't know where exactly, but the real culprits knew about this joint U.S.-Saudi operation and used the names of people in it to be the designated culprits because they were guaranteed that way that this would become a massive deep event which nobody would be able to get and, to and the bottom of. And perhaps also knew that some of the key plotters or key figures at least who were alleged to be part of the 9-11 plot had their own strange history of connections to the US intelligence uh, right. agencies. Um, talk a bit about that because that's again a, another parallel with the Kennedy assassination. We now know that Lee Harvey Oswald had a long history of contacts with uh, different intelligence agencies yeah. before, during. He had a thick CIA file. Thick CIA file that got right. thicker and thicker as yeah. Dallas came closer. And so talk about the, the parallels there and how right. in both cases, actually with Oswald and the hijackers of the planes in 9-11, for some reason, the intelligence spotlight was suddenly turned off them so, uh, <clears throat> shortly before the event. That's very important. First of all, by, for, in most of my books, my definition of a deep event has been phenomenological. It's something that it happens. We don't know what happened. We know if we're savvy, we know it's going to be covered up. And that's a phenomenon from outside, looking at how it appears. I'm almost at this point ready to venture an ontological definition, which is a deep event, or what I call a structural deep event that's going to affect the history of America, the, you're likely to find an ontological link to the intelligence agencies and above all the CIA. And that is the case with Oswald, and it is the case with these two uh, hijackers, alleged hijackers. And now, um, 
what you said about turning off the spot is absolutely crucial. If you're going to have a designated culprit like Lee Harvey Oswald, it's very important he not get picked up before the event because <laughs> then he won't fill the function. Well, Oswald actually went up, he had been apolitical when he came back to America in 1962 until a few weeks before the assassination. He goes very public, gets himself arrested in a fake event, gets himself on radio and TV in New, Orleans. in New Orleans, and all of this is recorded. So you'd say, okay, well then the FBI and the CIA are gonna get more interested, right? No. He had been on the watch list, and three weeks before the assassination, they took him off the watch list. This is a man who defected uh, ex-Marine to the Soviet Union, denouncing his country, saying he was going to give the Soviets military secrets, right. married a Soviet uh, woman, brought right. her back to the US unmolested. Right. A Soviet yeah. woman with an intelligence background herself exactly. was, they somehow got a visa. They, they, there was a poor man, he was a complete right-wing reactionary, and yet I share, I have real compassion for him. A man called Otto Otepka, he looked at this and said, this is crazy, it shouldn't happen. This man should not have gotten a passport. He got a new passport in June 1963 after all the things you described. And uh, he, people came in and uh, drilled into his safe, took him away from his office, barred him from his office, changed the locks on his office. So yes, the designated culprit, Lee Harvey Oswald, was preserved by Oh, and there was one more thing. The CIA hears from Mexico that he allegedly, I don't believe it, but allegedly had met a Soviet uh, officer in the Soviet embassy who was in fact a high KGB agent. And in fact, the C CIA started saying almost immediately, an expert on assassinations. Well, wouldn't you tell the FBI? No. The, uh, the CIA sent a long, long, message to the FBI about all this, and they left out the part about Kostikov, the Soviet agent. They obviously didn't want Oswald to be locked up or put under surveillance or anything which would have spoiled his role as a thing. That does, not, it sounds, and I have to watch myself, it sounds as if I'm saying the CIA did it, but I go back to what I said, there, there is no single secret team there is no single guilty agency. There are people who dwell within this huge system, and there is a continuity there, but there are different people in different uh, decades. But what is very striking to me that every one of these big, deep events we're talking about, you find a role, a rather large role, played by people who had access to this alternative uh, doomsday communication. And, and again, not to belabor this point, but again, the parallel with 9-11, there were all sorts of alarms. There was, a, as one person described it, a red blinking light yeah, going the on. The system was blinking red. Yes, that, that America was, was about to be attacked, and yet the dogs didn't bark for some reason. Right, and they, they didn't have, apparently the system, this multi-billion defense system we have, didn't perform on the day, right. It's, uh, but the, the really crucial analogy, and I have a, almost a chapter on this. By the way, there are all kinds of people who were being protected in uh, terrorists who were protected, you're, you may be Ali Muhammad Ali is, is one I start with, but there's a series of them. Well, well the Ali Muhammad example is, is quite, I think, uh, illuminating. So, Peter, why don't you take a little time to explain who Ali Muhammad is and right. what happened? If there. I could just finish yeah. that sentence. The protection, yeah. protection that the CIA gave to uh, Al Midar and Al Hamzi, these two people who entered the country, on a, one of them had a multi-entry visa, and the CIA protected them from FBI investigation. It gets more complicated, but also more active in the weeks just before 9-11 in a way which makes you think that somebody somewhere knew that 9-11 was going to happen and they're adjusting the record on these two people. But they're two at the end of a series that goes back at least to 1993. Ali Mohammed 
is a high-level person, very high-level person in al-Qaeda, somebody who speaks directly to Osama bin Laden, and who arranged, by the way, one of the things he did was arrange for Osama bin Laden to move from Afghanistan to uh, the Sudan. And that might sound like he just went and bought a ticket. No, there were about 170 people and a whole bunch of horses. <laughs> they, had, they needed a plane for the horses. It was a big operation. So it was a big operation to move him. He has a big family, many wives, big family. And he went up from, he was stationed, he lived not far from us in, I think, Mountain View. And uh, he went up to Vancouver to welcome another terrorist, they, they, and the, the RCMP had a file on the other terrorist. The other man was eventually convicted of terrorism. And uh, Ali Mohammed went up to Vancouver to bring him back into the United States. So the RCMP detained him. And what Ali Mohammed did when being detained by the RCMP, he pulled out a piece of paper with a phone number on it and said, phone this number and you will release me. And they phoned the number and they did release him. And the number was the number of an agent in the local San Francisco FBI office. Now this is something that was reported in the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's leading newspaper. You would, think it was, you would think it was news, especially if I say that was in early 1993 and later in the same year, he flew to Kenya and he started planning for the successful bombing of the US Embassy in Kenya, which was the first major Al-Qaeda operation against the United States. That's how important he was. And that's how serious it is that he was let go by the RCMP when he could have been kept in detention legitimately and, and, and imprisoned. Now, that has never been reported in any major newspaper the way it happened. In America. In America. And I give, I, I quote, the, it's, it's pathetic to see how the New York Times twisted one way, the Washington Post twisted another way, the Wall Street Journal twisted another way. The only candid account I found in America is from a Pentagon file from Fort Bragg, which is where actually Muhammad Ali was stationed as a member of US Special Forces at the same time that he was a member of Al Qaeda. And uh, so why did this happen? Now, you, Tim Weiner in his book says, oh, well, uh, is it Weiner? Somebody says uh, that uh, the FBI agent in uh, San Francisco was using him as an informant. Well, that happens to be true, but has nothing to do with his being released because oh, Ali Mohammed had been protected a year earlier on the East Coast when uh, you may remember the head of the uh, Jewish Defense League, Meir Kahan, was murdered. And immediately one man was picked up and when they went to his, an Arab, and when they went to this man's home, they found two more. And they found all kinds of files that are of great, with high security clearances. Files which Ali Mohammed had stolen for, or taken from, maybe he was authorized, I don't know. But anyway, he'd, take, he'd taken them from Fort Bragg. They were now, in this home with these two co-conspirators and immediately they said, we have our man. They actually called him a lone nut, which is, <laughs> which is evocative, a, evocative for the other period. events. Um, and so they covered up. Yeah. Uh, Ali Muhammad was training people to go to <laughs> Afghanistan and this was interesting because at this time, Russia had pulled out of Afghanistan and the, the CIA, much to the distaste of the State Department, they had a real battle about this, continued to back terrorists in Afghanistan, even though the Russian enemy was no longer there. And otherwise, it was becoming very unsymmetrical. We weren't matching what the Soviets were doing. The Soviets had withdrawn, and we were doing it anyway. And he was being protected in his training. And then, uh, the, when it was over in Afghanistan, they continued to protect him, and there was now people for Bosnia. And it's not known, usually, that America was backing 
terrorists, Muslim terrorists in Bosnia, we were supposed to be fighting them. There were two factions in, uh, in Bosnia, two American factions in Bosnia. We were on both sides in that war. Peter, I want to open it up to questions soon. I want to ask you one more question, though, before we do that, because um, I know there's going to be some very interesting uh, queries directed at you. But what I want you to get at before we do that is, because you, you write on this level too, Peter, not just about the, the details of this, uh, the shadow world, but really what it's done to the soul of, of America. You, you write so uh, eloquently about the situation where the, there's a strange fluid war of shifting alliances, um, and at, we don't know who's on our side from time to time or, or who we're supposed to be against. But at the end of the day, it seems to be a war that benefits the Saudi dynasty, that benefits sort of militaristic forces in the United States, that benefits uh, Israel, that benefits terror networks in some ways. Yeah. And you compare it to the war on drugs, yes. this self-generating war that goes on and on year after year because it serves the benefit to the benefit of both sides. Right. Uh, I, I, and what does that? And so, if you can comment on that, the strange nature of the self-generating war, and also what ultimately it does to a country like ours, where you have this kind of violence year after year, and the kind of repression that goes with it. Well, I hope people take seriously the idea that these wars create their own enemies and therefore justify the continuation. It's very obvious to me and to some other people that uh, the American oil companies, when they start drilling and investing tens of millions of dollars in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, they want to have an American army somewhere nearby so that the local leaders don't just listen to Moscow, they will also listen to Washington. So there is a very clear motive for wanting to get armies there, and when you had the project for the new American century, PNAC, it was all these neocons like Cheney and Rumsfeld, and they produced this document, and it talked about the need for a forward strategy, putting these armies there. They didn't mention oil, but they certainly were doing a thing. I think it's wonderful that here you have Cheney and Rumsfeld, this, I didn't get to mention this, for 20 years they were on the secret committee that was planning the Doomsday Project, even when neither of them was in the government. Both of them were chairman of big corporate CEOs. The very definition of the deep state. Yes, yes. So that, but they were planning for the suspension of the American Constitution, even though they weren't even in the government. And they were also publicly signing on to this PNAC document that called secretly for the event in effect, that was uh, for, for what could be implemented by 9 -11. And in the case of Cheney, working for the private sector, a military-related uh, company, right. that was going to benefit from this. Yes, his, his subsidiary, KBR, became the principal contracting uh, company for, uh, in, in Iraq. And, and there it's was, a sweet racket. <laughs> so, you know, you listed all those countries. Don't forget America is one of the countries. That yes. Their corporations and their war industry need this. I think, in a sense, it all goes back to the 70s. Uh, I, I, in my book, I see the period 1960 to 1980 when we had one president assassinated, uh, another couldn't run for re-election because he had such tension with his generals. The next one got re-elected for a second term but then had to resign, which is really extraordinary in American this politics. Is Nixon, and you think in part because of some of the intrigues related to the maneuverings. Right, and I'm not quite state. finished. And the next two were incumbents who were defeated when they stood for re-election, something that hadn't happened in American history since Herbert Hoover. So it was an unusual period, and what you really see in it, after the end of the Vietnam War, a lot of things change. And one of them was the CIA came under scrutiny, and you had people in Congress, like Church Senator Committee Church, who were trying to open it up and have a more open society, and then you secretly also had the CIA, or what I call in the book, I'm quoting someone else, a CIA within the CIA, 
plotting on what to do about church and really what to do about Carter because Carter was part of this whole spirit of getting the CIA out of covert operations. And anyway, in that same p crucial period, American corporations started exporting America's manufacturing power and putting it overseas. And we went instead, it was, we were either going to go back to a civilian economy after Vietnam, or we were going to maintain a military economy. And I think that was a serious point of contention in the 1970s, and it was unilaterally decided by the election of Ronald Reagan, who hugely increased the defense budget and did many other things, that we have been in a state of war, effectively, ever since. The Cold War, th th there was a threat it might stop when the Berlin War came on down. What do we get instead? A war on terrorism, and it, which actually began, the war on terrorism technically began way back in 1980. It was Reagan's campaign, only he said Moscow is the arch terrorist, and a phony book came out. Claire Sterling's. Claire Sterling's book. It's a, it, it's a junk book, but when Casey came in as new director of the CIA. He went to all these pros in the CIA analysts of the Soviet thing and plunked the book down on their desk and said, you have to write about this from now on. And all they refused and their reports were then rewritten by little political bohunks who came in. Uh, <laughs> And, and then they said at the end of the decade, we didn't know the end of the Soviet Union was coming. That's because they destroyed the brains of the CIA. You mustn't think that all CIA are covert operatives. There is an intelligence side. Quite, um, <coughs> there, there may be the not. analytical side. But it, it, and just a final comment, I mean, you do go to great lengths to uh, not overly personalize uh, the deep state, and yet there are these uh, fascinating individual characters that do keep popping up in these stories. William Casey, one the Reagan yeah. CIA director, Alan Dulles, of course, who I write about in my new book, uh, Rumsfeld, Cheney. It does need these kind of sinister characters on some level right. for it to work, and, and, and very effective at what they do. Yes. Uh, George Bush, the senior George Bush, I think, should be put in that category. He went into the CIA in 1976 to pave the way for something called Team B, which was the first effort to override the professionals in the CIA with a second estimate of the Soviet threat that would justify all And it this. undercut Carter. I mean, getting rid of Carter was, I think, a pivotal moment. I, I would say that the Kennedy assassination, Reagan's triumph, and 9-11 were the three, I think, deep events in my lifetime yeah, that I, did the most damage to this country. And I agree. And the run-up to Carter's uh, defeat, as and you write about this, the October surprise, uh, in which basically William Casey cut a deal with the uh, Iranians in Paris. That, that's part of it. But also, uh, what is not often looked at critically enough was the great oil price hike yes. of that period, which was blamed on the Iranian Revolution and the shortage of oil. I just read in a very good book yesterday how suddenly there was no more Iranian oil. Not true. Actually, the American oil companies in, in, imported more oil in the middle of that great crisis than they had in the previous years. So why did the price go way up in America? Why were people queued up? Those of you who remember, you know, some people had to wait. Well, it was the gas lines and the Iranian hostage crisis that killed Carter. The two of them together. What they, the reason that there was no gas was because the American oil companies, knowing that there was this huge crisis in America, were selling the oil abroad because they could get more money for it in Europe. And I don't think that was a purely economic decision, just like I don't think the recent drop in oil prices is a purely, it's partly economic, but it's not purely economic. It is partly political. So when Saudi Arabia and the CIA have a common, agree on getting a common enemy, which happens to be Putin right now, then, uh, then they manipulate the price of oil.
Yeah. So that's why so look, we have. I'm going. I, I think uh, we've given them enough to uh, chew on, <laughs> and uh, I love Peter if it's all right with you to open this up. Uh, Dan, you're of course more than welcome, and everyone else to pose some questions. But I hope you've got a sense that this is not political history as taught in the classroom tonight. <laughs> Even though Peter was a very esteemed professor for many years. Uh, of yes. English literature. Of English literature, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Let's start right here. One of the things that I find most disheartening and, and frightening is the impact over decades on the public mind uh, and the uh, character of Americans um, who, are not, uh, who are not necessarily informed about even one one thousandth of the things that you were talking about over these many decades and who uh, consume both fiction and uh, somewhat fictionalized news reporting that is filled with nothing but uh, oh, shows about uh, torturing people because there's a ticking time bomb and they're going to save the country, uh, like I think 24 is the name of that show, um, and all kinds of other sort of mass entertainment like the recent Sniper film that I think is really warping the American character um, in some frightening ways. So that, that's a maybe hard to whittle down to a question, but I wonder if you give thought to that either in your, in your research or perhaps in your poetry. The well, yes, actually, I, I'm going to, in my next book, try to write about just that issue. But let me say, um, unlike many critics of America, I believe that the American Revolution, for all its faults, I know that there's now a very interesting theory that it, it was uh, really uh, succeeded because the American ruling class knew that Britain was about to emancipate slaves and it makes slavery illegal. And because it was the basis of the economy, not just in the South, but also in the North, they wanted to have a revolution. That may be true. I think it is true. And yet it was still a, a great step forward in the world. The American Revolution, the idea that people can shape their own government and it was an inspiration to Europe. You got the whole Young Europe movement and the revolution of 1848. And eventually, um, you can say the united Europe that you see today, which has put an end to these senseless wars between France and Germany, all of that inspired by the American Revolution. So I'm an exceptionalist about the revolution. But the exceptionalism today, America is exceptional we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. So we, and we have more prisoners under lock and key than any other developed nation. So we're, we're now exceptional in the reverse direction. And it comes back to what you were talking about, that people are being conditioned. And believe the CIA from the very beginning, they took a great interest in what they call psychological warfare which is how to condition people to accept things. And under their charter, they could do it for people abroad, but some of the people that they trained turned around and did it domestically. And uh, you know, the, the whole, what's happened to newspapers, uh, the Washington Times, for example, has become an American newspaper that was founded officially by the Moonies, but probably really with, by the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, that's the South Korean Central Intelligence Agency, with the encouragement of people in the deep state in Washington. So that that makes the reactionary spoutings from the New York Times and the Washington Post look like centrist when compared to the Washington Times. So the, that is going on, and the movies, the Pentagon certainly has been involved in subsidizing pro-war movies if that's in my poem, Coming to Jakarta, how I taught school for a year. And uh, it was a boarding school, and on Saturday night we would watch a film, and it would be uh, these American Marines and their tanks napalming uh, the Japanese. And you would see people being incinerated before your eyes, and the kids were all cheering. These were 10-year-olds. And so I made them read a story about an actual lynching and they wouldn't let me finish the story because when it came home, it was more than they could bear. So yes, there is that brain, we are being brainwashed all the time by our culture of killing, which I do want to write about.
Go ahead. Thank you so much. This is just incredibly enlightening. The question that's been nagging at me ever since 9-11, and I'm sure has been nagging at a lot, a lot of other people too, is was it planned or was it just a great opportunity that they were ready for? And it seems to me it, it's always had to have been one of those two things, but I'm just Wondering. That's that's the million dollar question. That's yeah, <laughs> I wonder too. Yeah, <laughs> I you know I studied the Kennedy assassination for forty years, fifty years, and I don't know who did it. And the same is true of nine eleven. I would just say in both cases, some of the people involved were people inside government because they used legitimate government operating, well maybe not really legitimate, but sanctioned by, operations sanctioned by the government in order to be part of a larger conspiracy. It's a piggybacking, you say. You, you, you have one, you're, you want to use Lee Harvey Oswald for one operation, but then he becomes part of another operation piggybacked on the first one. And in 9-11, I think there were, <coughs> I don't know whether the hijackers have anything to do with the planes going into the building. I doubt it very much. But I do think that they were being involved in some sanctioned operations so that there have to be people somewhere in the government who knew that. That's all I know. And uh, in my book, I speculate actually, not, it's not worth wasting much time on, but we may have different conspiracies here. One is a conspiracy to have an event which will trigger a reaction, something like Operation Northwoods, because Northwoods talked about, you know, hijacking planes and actually killing people, but not in huge numbers. Northwoods was a uh, operation uh, contingency plan developed by the Pentagon during the Kennedy administration, for those who don't know. It was going to stage false flag acts of terrorism, and these acts of terrorism, including bombings in the streets of American cities, would be blamed on the Cuban government, on Castro, as a pretext for uh, an invasion of, of Cuba. So I'll just say that uh, not, having 2,000 people dead is beyond the parameters of what was planned in Northwoods, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the same band of conspirators. But they might have had more, another conspiracy piggybacked on the one that was piggybacked on the sanction operation. But Peter, if you don't mind me saying that, that's a kind of a holy cow statement that you just made about 9-11 that I think we should let linger here a bit. You, you basically uh, are saying that uh, those who are allegedly part of the 9-11 plot, including the hijackers, were like Lee Harvey Oswald in some way that you're not clear about being manipulated by the government. Yes. By, eight, but by at least elements within our government. My ignorance is so total, David, that I don't even know if the alleged hijackers ever got on the planes. <laughs> I mean, if they had got on the planes, it would be very, very easy for the government to prove it, but they only, they give us a a couple of photographs, and there's so many problems with the photographs they give us. The main one they've given us is some, uh, getting on a plane in Portland, or, uh, Maine, which has nothing to do with what hit the, the buildings. But I think they're playing games with us. I think they want us to get all, you know, studying these photographs or the, 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 the five frames of something hitting the Pentagon. They, or, you know, they want us to, you know, spend the next 20 years looking at those five frames, and I don't do that. I'm interested more in the overall way things that fit. I, I, I almost said structures, but I don't like the word structures. So. All, right. All right, let's get another question. Yes, I wanted to know uh, in terms of the origins of the modern American deep state, and you could speak to what forces shaped so quickly after World War II, the creation of the, C the National Security State, the consolidation of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the creation of the CIA, including allowing it to have covert activities as opposed to just analysis, which was one of the original <coughs> plans. But this, all these things happened very quickly after World War II, 1947, National Security Day. Yeah. And so to me, it happened so quickly, it means that during World War II, American elites were preparing this apparatus at the same time where, where uh, the Soviet Union is our ally, 
it's tearing up the guts of the major part of the German army because most of the heavy divisions were on the Eastern Front. So right in the middle of a war where we're allies with the Soviet Union, we're preparing to unleash this national security state in the Cold War. You, you put your finger right on it, and that's, that's the book. subject of my book. <laughs> that's his book. book. Alan Ellis, but, but Peter has a lot to say about this. Well, first of all, I, I, you know, I could quibble on some of the things you said, but basically I agree with you. But I do not think that what emerged at that time was the deep state. The deep state, to go back to what Roosevelt said, has been around, I would say, since before the revolution and what's help, helped arrange for the American Revolution. But yes, there was no secret about it that the Council of Foreign Relations, which is one of the uh, aspects of the deep state. Uh, they, they, they had their war peace studies going on through World War II. Alan Dulles, before he went to uh, Bern, I believe was part of that planning. I, some of what they planned, and by the way, this was Joint Council on Foreign Relations and State Department. It's hard to say whether it was public or private. It was a mix. It was very definitely a deep state planning for the post-war and it was planning for the kind of things you mentioned, including, I believe, the CIA. I can't prove that, but then one of the studies, war peace studies, is still classified. It's now 75 years later, 70 years later. That's, uh, so you feel it must be pretty sensitive, and I think it was. The idea of the CIA, I, I think I prove in my book, is an idea that came out of Wall Street and was imposed on Truman, who didn't want it, and who in stage one prevented, thought he had prevented it from happening when he shut down OSS, which was the wartime predecessor. And I think that's the key, is, is Wall Street, to, is, when you're talking about the modern origins of the deep state, and in the uh, final years of World War II and, and the post-war years, because they were key uh, Wall Street firms, law firms like Sullivan and Cromwell, where the Dulles brothers reigned, uh, and key figures like Wild Bill Donovan, who ran the OSS, Frank Wisner, who became a key uh, colleague and ally of Alan Dulles and the uh, CIA, and in the sort of transitional you know, stage, so. Don't forget and, so. and James Forrest, all the Secretary of Defense, these were all investment bankers, Wall Street lawyers, who shared the same very aggressive vision of America's place in the world. And they really developed that consensus, as Peter said, uh, in organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations and, and others. Um, you, you know, in some ways, it, it's a very, uh, although Peter doesn't like to use the word, the secret team and all that, and I agree with him on that. It is more structural than that and systemic than that. But there are these key figures and these key organizations in which that sort of policy cohered. There are and structures in the system. Definitely. And strategy, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think even things like events like the overthrow of uh, the Arbenz government, the democratic government in Guatemala, um, those came out of study groups of the Council on Foreign Relations. Right. Um, so I mean, you know, you have to have a mechanism for these people to, you know, to debate, to uh, consider, uh, you know, international events, and uh, they were brilliant about creating those kind of mechanisms. And then, uh, first in the private sector in Wall Street and these organizations, and then taking their ideas to Washington. Also, to come back to the oil companies. Uh, most people remember the overthrow of Mossadegh in 1953 as a CIA operation, and in a sense it was. But what happened there was that the CIA took on an operation that had begun by the oil companies and the British. And uh, under Truman, uh, Churchill had asked Truman to do this, and Truman refused. And instead, he sent Atchison to, uh, Atchison or Harriman, Harriman, well, anyway, somebody. He sent, I think perhaps Haram, he sent someone to Tehran to see if they couldn't work out a deal very like what was now happening in Saudi Arabia where the host country and the oil company split the profits 50-50. And Iran was willing to do it, but the Anglo-Iranian oil company refused because they didn't want to give up so much of their profits. 
And then when uh, the oil companies put a huge amount of money into the 1952 election to elect Eisenhower, and remember, Eisenhower doesn't become president until 19 January of 51, but uh, almost three, three, 53, three. sorry. But already in November of 52, the CIA is starting to do, prepare for TP Ajax the operation which overthrew Mossadegh, even though the president is still Truman, who had forbidden it, and the president who's going to authorize it hasn't taken power yet. So that is, I think, how the CIA is like a functioning arm of the deep state, and in this case, the oil companies. Yes, in a sense, and it was- And Truman was appalled, as the gentleman was suggesting, at what happened to the CIA, right. an agency that he created. He did see it more as an agency that would gather intelligence and sort of process it for the White House, exactly. not as a, uh, as a rogue outfit that was going around overthrowing governments all around the world. And he said so right after the Kennedy assassination, which was an Very tellingly. And, uh, of course, the media sort of trashed him for it. They don't know it was all set up in 1947. It wasn't. It was all done through OPC, which was uh, Frank Wisner's little new arm, staffed at the top level almost exclusively with Wall Street. So to people. me, Peter, some of the most interesting moments in American history <clears throat> are when the deep state comes in conflict with our democratic government. Yeah. with certain presidents who do stand up to them, to an extent Truman, although he, I think, also uh, enabled the national security state to a great degree, but even more so President Kennedy, with fatal results for, for Kennedy. Uh, and that story, I think, has not still been fully told, although we will do our best in this next book about Alan Dulles. Um, but that is the moment when the, everything hangs in the balance for us as a nation. Is the democratic government that we've elected going to prevail, or are these forces that are much less accountable and much more aggressive? And generally, of course, unfortunately, it is the deep state that prevails. And what I'm saying in my book is that in this period, 1960 to 1980, there was a real struggle between what you might call the covert side, the deep state, and the public state, church committee, uh, poor Stansfield Turner, and so on. Uh, and since the election of Reagan, there isn't that struggle anymore because the deep state is secure at the heart of the public state. And that is a huge change in this country, which accounts for so many other things. Well, I would changed. suggest it, it's now such a dangerous and extreme situation that during the second Bush administration, what we had was the CIA, in many ways, being the rational force within government and leaking about their plans to move the war next to Iran yes. uh, to, to journalists like Seymour Hersh at New York, uh, the New, York, New Yorker magazine because the CIA was so alarmed about the White House and Dick Cheney. That's how <laughs> scary it's become. Yes, and there were, there were some Pentagon generals, too. I mean, Dr. General Shelton, who... That's one of the similarities with JFK assassination is that so many people were out of town, including the president and vice president. The first time the president and vice president ever traveled together was Dallas in 1963. Most of the rest of the cabinet were on a plane going to Japan. So there were very few people in power in Washington. Now, 9-11 is not quite so clear, but there were some key figures not in Washington. One of them was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who was one of the people who was very concerned about this eagerness to go and uh, fight a war which a sensible general could see was not going to be won, not on the scale that Donald Rumsfeld wanted. And there was, so there was, again, a kind of dissonance, not just in CIA, but also in the Pentagon. Fractures. I'm sorry, we've been holding this gentleman up. Yes. Oh, it's, not it's, me. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Your uh, metaphor for America's pretense to its own defense has been the killing culture. Currently doing a star turn in our local theaters may well be the poster boy for that metaphor. I'm curious, Mr. Scott, if in Mr. Talbot's seat was sitting Chris Kyle, what specifically would you want to say to Chief Kyle? Well, I have a very delicate stomach, so I haven't gone to see American Sniper. 
I don't go to those kind of movies. I, I do have a general idea of what it's about. And I actually hear that it's quite a complex movie, that it's, a, one of the reviews said it's a, a, a devastating anti-war movie and a devastating pro-war movie both. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to believe that. Um, of course, I regret that he was killed. Um, but yes, I, it, it's not pure propaganda, that movie, but it is definitely a product of the killing culture. I mean, that uh, I would, I, I'm a Canadian, and uh, I, I got into a fight over Charlie Hebdo because uh, I wouldn't say Je suis Charlie. I, I think that freedom of speech is very important, and therefore I don't want to sound as if I would you know, censor a film. Uh, at the same time, freedom of speech for me is not an absolute right. It is a precious value that we have to cherish along with other precious values. And right now, I think in the world, one of the values that we have to cherish above all is openness, the ability to live with other quite different cultures and tolerate them and respect them. And I think that what Charlie Hebdo was doing was absolutely not in that spirit of openness at all. I've taken a lot of heat for this, by the way. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, probably I am just the only one person who represents Russia here in this audience. <laughs> Moscow. Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks that you allowed me to come here, and I want to thank you for your information, because probably during this two, uh, half an hour, I received more information than I received in my previous years studying in the school in Russia. It's a special aspect of learning. Thank you very much. Just uh, what I wanted to ask you. Um, before I ask, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, sorry for my English. I will try. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, better than my Russian, I promise you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I, I travel a lot. I travel many, many countries. Almost two months I change country and uh, go everywhere. Europe, uh, Latin America, America, Russia, CIS uh, countries. And what I see, everywhere the same situation. Uh, mass media try to manipulate people mm -hmm. from um, TV, radio, all stations. That's why I don't have TV, I don't watch TV at all. Uh, <laughs> help you too. <laughs> so, but uh, when sometimes I meet with different people in every country, I see how this manipulation touch them. And for example, if you'll be in Russia, you'll receive one information about these economical, political situations between countries worldwide. If you'll come to America, you'll get another information. If you'll go to Europe, you'll get... So I just believe that I see that it's just total manipulation with our mind. And uh, maybe not you... Total, not total, not total. Okay. You know, the internet allows you to Re learn about America from The Guardian in London and RT in Moscow, and you can learn useful things from all of these sources. Yes, I agree. But uh, maybe uh, you know that uh, during one month in November, all Russian people uh, just become p more poor twice. Yes? Just, for example, you can imagine if you re receive like your salary, suddenly during your, uh, the one month, you started to receive half of this salary. And it's a really a big problem for all Russian people from one side. Because it's of the eco economic crisis. Yes, economical and crisis. Inflation. And this is the result of manipulation. Mm -hmm. Manipulation with dollar, manipulation with euro, manipulation with oil uh, worldwide uh, from one side. And from another side, it is very bad situation with spirituality that a lot of um, spiritual people are in the prison because it's not like here you can speak about what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, but what, what is about my question? I really see how the Russian people suffer from economy, from spiritual block, blockage. And I know, I have many friends in the United States, in all the world, I know that people, uh, they are very open, they are very friendly. For example, now, please believe me, I... <laughs> Very open to all of you. And my question is, what uh, is your prognosis uh, for future, nearest future, between uh, United States and Russia? Good question. Thank um, you. I think I, 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 can, I, I can promise you that I have worried a great deal about this, and I talk about my, with my friend Dan Ellsberg about this. Uh, I hope that Europe will be 
uh, stand up for itself and not feel that it has to be manipulated by Washington. Uh, Angela Merkel is no heroine of mine, but uh, she recognizes that the European economy will, if the Russian economy goes way, way down, the European economy will suffer too. All our economies are interwoven now. I think there are some people in America who would not be unhappy to see the Russian involvement in the European economy replaced by a greater American involvement. America, there are some people in America who are predicting that in the, <clears throat> say, five or 10 year future, American oil and gas will heat Europe the way Russian oil and gas is heating Europe today. That kind of thinking is the kind of thinking that led to World War I, and I hope that it is not going to prevail. And the best hope that it won't prevail will be from the leaders in Europe uniting and saying to Washington, no, it is not in our interest to punish the, the Russian economy. We all here are dependent on the thriving of that economy. You're asking me to predict. I, I won't predict, but it, it's me, to me crystal clear that the Ukraine thing should be settled as quickly as possible. A plebiscite can determine, I know it's not easy, but in essence, if the East wants to be separated, whether in a federation or totally, it's a higher priority to maintain peace and security and uh, a kind of evenness, a tolerance across that re-emerging Iron Curtain, uh, which we are imposing, by the way, not the Russians. Um, that, that, that's a very high priority. We say the Ukrainian thing should not be allowed to bring America to the world to a third world war the way that um, Bosnia Herzegovina was able to do in 1914. Thank you. Peter, first of all, I want to thank you very profoundly for your work because it has inspired me to redouble my own research and study of deep politics, which began with uh, uh, my interest in the Contra War, which pulled threads right into BCCI and, and that part of the deep state back then. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Uh, your courage is uh, quite remarkable and exceptional in this if age. If I did this in Russia, I'd be courageous. Yeah. If I do it <laughs> no, even, in America, I don't think I deserve that. No, oh, no, even here, there's very few people that will speak to the deep state like you speak to the deep state, uh, far, far too few. Uh, secondly, I would like to bring to everyone's attention that something that you touched on a little bit, and that is that on the morning of 9-11, when the national emergency, the state of emergency was declared, which enabled the continuity of government, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, periodically Bush would renew that national emergency. Mm -hmm. One of the first things that Obama did after he was inaugurated, he was whisked away to sign some documents, one of which was to renew that state of national emergency, which he's also done periodically and which exists today, which a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. This continues to enable the continuity of government, something which when a few brave Congress people have been uh, harangued from their uh, constituents to ask about, they were basically told to shut up and sit down, that the continuity of government was not something they were gonna be uh, informed about, and, uh, and so anyway. So this that, that's something that people should be aware of. That's a very important point you yeah. raise. And I know Peter has a lot to say. I, about. I have, uh, it's, it's quite central to my book, actually. One of the- How many people know that we're still living under a state of emergency? Yes. And it's a state, because of a post-Watergate reform from Senator Church, there is a National Emergencies Act, which says that an emergency can only be proclaimed for one year and then if you want to prolong it, then the pre they have to do. It wasn't right away. He did, it, it was September that it was first proclaimed, and it's always in September that the, whoever the president is, they re redo it for another year. Yep. But the National Se Emergencies Act says that Congress must review that emergency and either approve it or terminate it. 
and they're given six months to do that. And it's and good. what are the key provisions of the state of emergency, Peter? Well, it, it, it puts into motion things that we don't know. There are COG provisions. We know that Bush introduced some new ones in 2007, so they exist, but we don't know what they are. And there was a congressman from uh, Oregon who pushed by his 9-11 constituents who was sitting on the Homeland Security Committee and he said, I'd like to see those provisions. He was told, you don't have the clearance to see them. <laughs> so the whole committee, the chairman of the committee signed a letter saying we need to see those provisions. Particularly if you understand that informally you're told they provide for suspension of the Constitution, wouldn't you think that somebody in Congress would be allowed to see it? No, they weren't allowed to see it. So you ask me, what are those provisions? I certainly have no idea. Congress has no idea. Uh, we tried, I, with a congressman, a former congressman, Dan Hamburg, we tried to get a nationwide movement to force Congress to do what the law says they must do. And one person, I'm afraid this is hearsay, but it's very important to me, one person said, well, my congressman said that provision of the law has been overridden by COG. So <laughs> that would prove that the Constitution has been suspended in certain respects. I come back to this plane. You know, the real, the, there is a, the very first prose in my book is the CNN account of the E-4B doomsday plane over the White House. And in that footage, you actually see the plane. Um, unfortunately, it's not big like this. It's a, almost a dot, but you can see that it has a little bump on top of the 747. That is a symbol for what went wrong on 9-11 that this government was giving place to the secret government in the doomsday plane. Finally, if I may, uh, just as economic strikes politics, uh, my studies look into how deep economic strives deep politics. You touch very briefly in your book about the petrodollar, and I don't think enough people understand yeah. the absolute necessity for the deep economy to maintain the uh, supremacy of the petrodollar. Uh, and, and keeping the uh, American economy, which is basically a, a, a huge Ponzi scam afloat. Yeah, I, yes, I do it briefly in this book, and I did it, I've done it in two or three books, and perhaps more extensively elsewhere. But uh, you know, the American dollar was in very deep trouble because of the Vietnam War. 1968, they really closed the gold window. France was just pulling gold out of America and in 68. Uh, that was at the time that Westmoreland wanted his uh, hundreds of thousands more troops. And the two decisions, closing the gold window and the saying no to the Westmoreland proposal, uh, went together. And then in 71, Nixon took America off the gold standard completely. So we now print money that has nothing, it doesn't stand for anything, it's just money. You want, you want to take this money, this $100 bill to the bank and get something, you get another $100 bill. That doesn't work economically. The real commodity that supports the American dollar is oil because of OPEC. Uh, originally, Nixon and uh, Kissinger went to the Shah of Iran and to the King of Saudi Arabia in 72 and said, look, let the price of oil go up. Everyone will have to pay more for their oil, but in OPEC, they'll have to pay in dollars. And that was made formal by actually under Carter. Uh, so that when you buy OPEC oil as a rule, and if say you're a country like Gambia that doesn't have oil, you have to buy dollars to pay for your oil. And this global demand for dollars, or what we call petrodollars, to pay for oil, is what helps stabilize the dollar. It's going to change for many reasons. One is America is actually becoming, it's already a gas, it's the number one gas import, exporting country, and it may surpass Saudi Arabia as an oil exporting. Some people want it to do that. 
other people, saner people, say, for heaven's sakes, if we don't want to, this, this planet to fry, we have to produce less oil, not more oil, but that's a whole different story. And uh, anyway, so that the, the petrodollar star story is changing, but look, Saddam Hussein said, I'm not going to, I'm going to sell my oil for euros. I sell to Europe, let Europe pay in euros. Look what happened to Saddam Hussein. <laughs> then Gaddafi said he was going to do the same thing. So, and Iran all along has been trying to do this, and I think maybe actually is doing it now. So it, the system is breaking down to some extent, but you can see the close fitting between the needs of the petrodollar and the needs to deal with these dangerous threats to America, like Saddam Hussein and, uh, and Gaddafi and so on. Peter, we have two more questions. We've got to keep them and succinct. Be short. You want me yeah. to be short, yes. Exactly. Questions short and answers short. One question in three parts. Uh-oh. Doesn't sound short. <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> maybe, maybe just do one. Uh, do your favorite one. I go back to 1945, which predates, and the history comes forward, Operation Paperclip. Yeah. Yeah, the German um, legacy and American fascism. I mean, it, it all kind of fits together, right? Because these German scientists that came over here... They yeah, I mean, I, this is actually one of the points in my new book, Alan Dell, so I'll just quickly jump in. Uh, you know, in I say that the third, the third Reich was not so much defeated by the Allies as, re, as reconstituted. I mean, people don't realize the extent to which the West German government was composed of high-ranking former Nazis, including the head of the intelligence agency, Reinhard Galen, and Hans Globke, who was the chief of staff for Konrad Adenauer. Those two men really basically ran the show. So uh, that was because of our own intelligence needs. Uh, they were the front lines in the war against the Soviet they, Union. They infiltrated into our government. Yep. And the paperclip wasn't the worst. There were other Nazis. The paperclip was Nazis who were primarily uh, missile experts, engineers, and scientists. And we wanted, both Russia and America were equal in this. They both wanted to get the German engineers. And uh, so, some of those people were also very active Nazis, but we also imported into this country some people who were, had no engineering skills at all, but were former killers. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and of course, it didn't matter because they had Sputnik before we, you know, they, they were in space before we were, right? Right, <laughs> right. No, good, good points, thank you. Yeah. All right, final question of the evening. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Mohammed Khalil bin Abdullah. I'm an IVW, Iraq Veterans Against the War. I served in the military two, from 2003 to 2005. Um, a lot of people know me because I'm somewhat of a terrorism, counterterrorism expert. I speak Arabic. Uh, <laughs> I'm also an indigenous person, an indigenous Muslim to America. Um, I just got out of jail over 24 hours ago. Um, I was on 24-hour uh, lockdown because I oppose uh, the human rights issues that are going on in America. So my question has to do with that, um, about uh, the situation post 9-11 with indigenous Muslims like myself, the United States, who were supposedly free from slavery. Um, but what 9-11 really did is it took away our rights to citizenship, so now we're in a quasi-state where we're not really citizens, you know. Um, I was placed in SF General Hospital on lockdown in a psychiatric ward because I'm Muslim and because I worked for the government. And when the police pulled me over, I identified myself as retired federal law enforcement and military. And, you know, they didn't want to accept that, me as an African-American indigenous person and then a Muslim, I have an Arabic name. so. We're seeing our, our rights being eroded. We don't have the same constitutional rights as regular Americans do, although we didn't immigrate to this country. We've been in this country for hundreds, or, so for some of us, thousands of years. The ones of us that have Native American blood, even uh, you see like a lot of the civil rights movement, it's splintered. A big portion of them became Muslim, and then a big portion of them were already Muslim, like my family, uh, the French Creoles, um, which go all the way up to Canada, a lot of us are Muslim. I'm also French Creole uh, from Louisiana. 
of my roots, and they're mixed blood with Native Americans. We're tied with the Native American movement going up in Canada right now. So you see the suppression going on inside of America. So I just wanted to hear your guys' comments uh, about yeah. that. I do in my I book. Do. I do in my book talk about the terrible treatment of Muslims right after 9/11. Most people don't know that uh, because of the, this was a COG provision for warrantless detention, we don't know how many, but well over a thousand Muslims were just rounded up and kept. And I met one of these people. Under brutal conditions. Yes, uh, I met somebody who was an academic, and uh, he, they say, he told me, they beat him so badly that there was blood in his urine. Why? Because he was Muslim. They wanted to get all these people in and then find out who were good and who were bad. And after 80 days, they let him go and said, just forget about this and we'll forget about you. But it's much worse than that because every mosque now probably has an FBI informant in it. And these are usually people who are sort of coerced into becoming informants. You get a traffic infraction and it's you know six months in jail or become an informant. And there have been whole books written about the FBI abuse of this informant thing. Nearly all of the brilliant successes you read about in the papers, how the FBI has foiled another attack, it's usually an attack in which the explosive was handed to some poor guy by the FBI informant. So it is a very bad situation, and, uh, and it's, it's kind of shocking that uh, the rest of us who are not Muslim are paying about as much attention to it as the Nazi, the ordinary Germans in the 30s did to what was happening to the Jews in, in, in Germany. Well, I want to uh, thank you all for being here tonight uh, and thank the Green Arcade once again for staging this event. Thank you, Patrick Mark. <laughs> and of course, I want to thank Peter Dale Scott for his lifetime of work. And uh, I will agree with what someone else said here. Uh, Peter says he's not a hero. He's intellectually been incredibly uh, intrepid and we owe uh, him a lot for what he's uh, produced over the last s the low many years, Peter. Yeah. <laughs>